So we gather in prayer. Let us pray. Wonderful God, thank you for the sensations of sacred breath, your miraculous gift of life to each one of us. We lift our hearts to you. Our souls sing with joy. May we know your presence in all our challenges and may our thankfulness pour out of our lives. Giving God, no money can buy your love. No words can adequately express our thanks. No actions can fully demonstrate our gratitude. As we sing, as we pray, as we listen to your word, we offer you our best and celebrate your presence with us now and each moment of every day. Creator God, loving Savior, living Spirit, we celebrate your generosity in receiving all that we would give you. We rejoice in your generosity as you pour out your blessing on all you have made. We commit ourselves to reflecting your generosity in our lives and by giving the best of all we have, all we are, when and wherever there is need. And so forgive us, faithful God, on those occasions when we fill the rooms we enter with negativity and not warmth. Forgive us when we justify our reluctance to give and to share. Forgive us when we are slow to express gratitude and take what we have for granted. Forgive us and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. And so as we come to you seeking your forgiveness, may we know that forgiveness is ours 
as you pour it out on us, may our sensation of it being poured out upon us become more like a torrent overflowing with your love, spilling out from the forgiveness you pour out on us into the forgiveness we pour out and the grace we pour out in your name to those around us. As your love overspills from our lives into the lives of those you place around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray now a prayer which has been offered uh, through Christian aid for the situation in Ukraine. God of all peoples and nations, who created all things alive and breathing, united and whole, show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence. We hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia, every child and every adult, we long for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares. When nations no longer lift up sword against nation. We cry out for your peace. Protect those who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Be with those who are bereaved. Change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression and fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. Kindle again in us a love of our neighbor and a passion for justice to prevail and a new, renewed recognition that we all play a part in peace. Creator of all, hear our prayer and bring us peace. Make us whole. Amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples as we pray with one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. Just to uh, explain, uh, sometimes the shirt I'm wearing today, I've worn on Easter Sunday because of its bright colors, uh, but I have been wearing it since the troubles in uh, Ukraine uh, in unity with the Re Ukrainian people, just because it's the only shirt I have which has both blue and yellow on it. Uh, but uh, uh, it's for me, it's something which is a way in which uh, I can show uh, that solidarity, uh, as well as all the other things that we're doing, including the prayers that we just said. Uh, we come to that point in the service now where if there are any youngsters amongst us, they have an opportunity to go and do uh, their own uh, things. Well, Pam is obviously a youngster, uh, so she's off to, uh, to have fun somewhere else. And as she goes, let's just pray. Lord, as we just prayed for people of all ages in Ukraine. So we know that here in this space, that young and old, you love us all equally. So bless us equally in all that we do, both in this space and where the young people gather, that we may join as one, one in your spirit, one as your body, one Jesus, one Lord. Amen.
And we're going to sing our second hymn now as we also take up our offering. Great God, your love has called us here. Number 499 from Singing the Faith. We ask that you will indeed make all things new in us and through us each and every day. So we offer these gifts as a praise to your name and we offer these gifts as a sign of our commitment that we will be agents not just for ourselves alone but for the sake of your kingdom in bringing all things new to this world in need of grace. Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And then we have our readings first from uh, Philippians and then from John's Gospel. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b to 14. If anyone makes claims of that kind, I can make a stronger case for myself. Circumcised on my eighth day, Israelite by race, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born and bred, in my practice of the law, a Pharisee, in zeal for religion, a persecutor of the church, by the law's standard of righteousness without fault. But all such assets I have written off because of Christ. More than that, I count everything sheer loss, far outweighed by the gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I did in fact forfeit everything. I count it so much rubbish for the sake of gaining Christ and finding myself in union with him, with no righteousness of my own based on the law, nothing but the righteousness which comes from faith in Christ, given by God in response to faith. My one desire is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and to share his sufferings in growing conformity with his death, in hope of somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. It is not that I have already achieved this. I have not yet reached perfection, but I press on, hoping to take hold of that for which Christ want to, once took hold of me. My friends, I do not claim to have hold of it yet. What I do say is this, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what lies ahead, I press towards the finishing line to win the heavenly prize to which God has called me in Christ Jesus. The Gospel reading is John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover festival, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They gave a supper in his honour, at which Martha served, and Lazarus was among the guests with Jesus. Then Mary brought a pound of very costly perfume, pure oil of nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair, till the house was filled with fragrance. At this, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who would betray him, protested, could not this perfume have been sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not out of any concerns for the poor, but because he was a thief. He had charge of the common purse and used to pilper the money kept in it. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you have always among you, but you will not always have me. Thanks be to God. Before we, uh, we go on to our next hymn, I just thought I'd highlight for you the, uh, the following passage from the reading we've we just heard, because I don't know what uh, you'll be hearing next week uh, when we come to Psalm Sunday, uh, sorry, Palm Sunday, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the telling of it in John's Gospel is really quite different uh, from the way that the other Gospels put an emphasis. And so following immediately on from the passage you just heard, it says, now a large crowd of Judeans learned that Jesus was there, and so they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. 
And what becomes very clear when you read John's Gospel is that as well as all the things that we think about on Palm Sunday, about kingship and all of that, as Jesus is heading towards the cross in Jerusalem, uh, that also it's very firmly rooted in the excitement that the crowds have at what he's been doing, and particularly this fantastic story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And I think in other ways that we'll be hearing about in a few moments, this is a sign, as John would put it, that we are all in this together. Uh, not just in the mess together, but we are also in resurrection hope together as well. Because if it's true for Jesus and true for Lazarus, then it is true for us. And so it's a slightly different take on where the Palm Sunday celebrations traditionally go in many churches. And if I've poured uh, something all over the person who's speaking at next week, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but if you, you hear a similar thing twice, then it probably means that God really needs you to hear that we are all in this resurrection uh, promise together. Uh, but we're going to uh, go back into the, uh, the sentiment of the first reading that we heard from Philippians now as we sing, All I Want Held Thee. As we were gathering for worship this morning, then in the normal way that people do these things, and there was an inquiry as to how one another were with various people, 
and for some people it was uh, not a surprise to hear but for, I think for many of you it was that uh, uh, I too have joined the Covid club so uh, a fortnight ago uh, I had Covid but I was not sure whether it was a cold or not then and I tested clear uh, when I joined the the thinner than normal congregation at Batley, which was very much augmented by a baptism party. So on Monday morning, when I tested positive, then I had to make phone calls both to uh, the stewards and to the baptism party, just to let them know that they'd been uh, mingling with one of the, uh, the great unwashed of the uh, COVID pandemic. And in all of that, and I am clear now, by the way, uh, I realised that what felt to me is to be nothing more than a mild cold really uh, is, as many of you will know, more debilitating than you first realise because I still find myself now, and you might even hear it in my voice, uh, feeling more tired and struggling uh, for, for breath sometimes, not in a, a wheezy way, but just aware that it's, it's a more conscious thing that I'm doing. And it sort of reminds me of when I had pneumonia back in 2007, uh, which was really quite a serious bout, and it took me longer to recover from that than I'd ever expected. And so uh, we're all in this together, as Boris was telling us two years ago, when we were heading into the first lockdown. And uh, some of us might sort of hear his words with a lack of credulity now, uh, as they then proceeded to go into party season later on. But we are, so many of us now, people who have either a direct engagement with COVID or have been very close to somebody else who has. And this thing of fatigue came through each conversation that I was having even this morning in this place because that's the thing which has surprised people probably more than anything else, even if some of the other symptoms have been relatively mild. One of the things that I think comes through in different ways, the two readings that we had this morning, is that sense of being in something together. I want to tell you about a woman in one of my churches in my first appointment on the Isle of Wight. Uh, she's gone to glory now, her, her name is Joan, and Joan was uh, very much a lady. She was very polite, very well-spoken, very sort of prim and proper, always very well turned out, and she was somebody who had retired from running a gift orientated business on the island with her husband uh, before his retirement and then subsequent death. So I never knew her husband. But I knew Joan quite well, and she would come to uh, one of the Bible study groups that we had running at that time. And I can remember on one particular occasion, we were looking at this passage that we heard from Philippians 3 this morning, and I was talking to them about some of the way that the, the Greek in the passage added extra emphasis to the way that Paul experiences the change in his life from what he had before, which he now counts as loss, uh, compared to what he has now, and how the language ramps up through the passage. After the Bible study, leaving with her friend Jenny, who'd taken her there in her car that afternoon, she said, well, she said, do you think Nigel says those things just to shock me? And uh, Jenny just laughed, but she told me about it a few days later. We move on a few months now, and Joan is having some problems, some medical problems, and she's really worried about it. And so she spoke to Jenny about it, and Jenny shared it with Joan's permission with me, and so I arranged to go and see her. Because I too had had some medical problems previously, and had previously had, on two occasions, the procedure that she was dreading. Because what she was dreading 
was that the people who were trying to find out exactly what was wrong with her were wanting to put a camera where a camera you never imagined would go. I think some of you will be uh, guessing where the camera entered Joan's body, uh, but certainly if you don't know, then uh, ask somebody who's smiling now and they might explain it to you. But Joan really couldn't get her head around the discomfort and the indignity of what she was about to experience and how it would be for her. And so in her very neat and tidy lounge, sitting in front of her coffee table, which had the most beautiful marquetry top on it, something which I always envied and now sits in Jenny's house since Joan's passing, we talked about my experiences of how a camera had been used in a similar way with me and how there was much less to worry about than she was actually anticipating. And as I was leaving Joan's home, then she said to me, do you know, she said, I could never have imagined that I would have such a conversation with my minister about such things. And that was all she said. But I think from what Jenny said a couple of days later again, then I'd put Joan's mind at ease. And at least she knew that she was not going through anything that her minister hadn't already done. When Paul is writing to the people in Corinth, he is, sorry, in Philippi, he is in prison. He is going through a really terrible time. He is probably each and every day anticipating that his death might not be far away. If you can imagine being stripped of your liberty, being in conditions that you wouldn't choose, your health being in a poor state, and your mind on all sorts of things. Paul, when he's writing to the people in Philippi, on more than one occasion, implores them to rejoice. And so, when we read this letter, then at the beginning of the chapter that we, we heard from, we're told, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And then, as we heard right at the beginning of worship in chapter 4, it goes on to say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And Paul, when he's rejoicing, is in dire straits. When we heard Jill Reed earlier, we heard her describing, using Paul's words, about how he was such a wonderful Hebrew man. Somebody who was born into the tribe of Benjamin. Somebody who, as far as his practice and his righteousness and all that sort of thing, nobody could be any better. According to the righteousness stipulated in the law, says Paul, I was blameless. And yet, as he's writing these words and encouraging the people in Philippi to rejoice in all things, he himself is in a terrible situation. And yet, he describes, compared to where he was, when everything in the garden was rosy, when he was a really successful Pharisee, and all of that, that all of that now counts as loss compared to what he has now. In his imprisonment, in the squalor, in the dire straits that he finds himself in, all that he had before with all its splendor and privilege and the pomposity which probably he carried around with him every day, all of it is as lost now compared to knowing Christ Jesus. 
And I think what Paul is trying to do is in the same way that we've all realized over these last couple of years is that he's saying we are all in this together. That no matter how bad your situation is now, none of it is worse than not knowing Jesus. Because for him, it is actually, as we sung a few moments ago, it is the best. It is better than anything that he has ever known, even in the situation that he finds himself. And so what shocked Joan so much in that Bible study was my emphasis on the language which Paul uses, because he uses a word which is quite rightly termed as loss uh, on more than one occasion, which then builds into a crescendo as he goes through the passage. So on more than one occasion, as we're going through this passage, he uses, and I'm not a Greek scholar, so if anybody is, please excuse my pronunciation. He uses a word uh, which is zemian, or zemian, uh, which basically means loss. And that's what he's talking about. And what a lot of modern translations tend to do now, and as we heard was read earlier, uh, they tend to then turn down the final way that this is expressed because he uses a different word. And so the word we heard was rubbish. In some translations, modern translations, we hear waste. And in some, they just repeat it as loss again, as if it's the same word. And Paul is wanting the people in Philippi to understand just how much he feels this. And so he uses a word which is, as Joan was suspecting with me, intended to shock. Because although it can be translated rubbish, as we heard earlier, if any of you have a King James Bible at home, you'll find that the King James Bible uses something more akin to what Paul is meaning because the King James uses dung. The word actually means dung. So moving from this repeating of Zemian, he then moves into talking about it being rubbish or waste or dung, which is a word which is scubula. And what Paul is trying to say, and I think you would all be shocked if I use this language in church, is he's trying to say something in the way that we might talk about a four-letter word, and there's two that I can think of, one beginning with S, the other one beginning with C, which both mean rubbish and excrement. And that's what Paul is saying. So remember that he is in prison. He is in probably one of the worst phases in his life, as far as anybody would measure it. But he's encouraging the people of Philippi to rejoice. And he's saying that with all the splendor of what he had before, that is all now scubula compared to what he has now. And he uses this word really to make them sit up and pay attention. It's an extreme word. He only ever uses it once in his writings. In fact, it's the only time it appears in the whole of the New Testament. And so Paul's intention is to shock. And so what he's wanting them to get is that his rejoicing is just as extreme and just as shocking. But I think what he's also saying is that as with many people in the early church, they often find themselves in difficult situations because one of the challenges in the early church, and it comes through this writing uh, to the people in Philippi, is that they are often being betrayed by their fellow Jews because there's a difference between those that have made the conversion and those that haven't and sometimes to ingratiate themselves within the Roman 
empire, then those Jews who are otherwise being persecuted, persecuted then actually turn on their fellow Jews who have turned to Christ and dob them in. It's part of, I think, what comes through also the struggles that Jesus is going through when he suddenly finds that he's been challenged by Judas. And one of the differences, again, with the way that John describes a story that we heard from his gospel is that he really emphasizes why Judas is this person who Jesus finds himself at odds with in this situation where the oil is being poured out and where worship is, is, is just filling the room with this heady scent. And Judas says, well, shouldn't we have other priorities? So both Jesus and Paul find themselves in difficult situations, but in both, as there is with the resurrection, we are all in this together. So the thing that I, I wanted to take from this today is that we may be going through a really bad time. As much as there might be criticism against our government and other world leaders, then through these last two years, there have been really unprecedented times, certainly in our lifetimes, and in the situation which is now horribly still playing itself out in Ukraine, we find ourselves in very difficult situations. With the crisis, with the environment, which is still ongoing, because if you remember, there was the Extinction Rebellion before we got into COVID restrictions and all of that, and that is still playing itself out. We may think that we are in the worst of times. It may be within your own lives, in your personal circumstances, that you feel that you are in the worst of times. Paul is trying to say, no matter how bad things are, no matter how things may feel as though it's against you and not as good as the good old days, which Paul is evoking, that actually the worst thing is to be without Jesus. So rejoice again, I say rejoice, says Paul. Let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And then he says, And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are all in this together. And Jesus is with us in the midst of, his all, of it all. And the best is yet to come. Amen. As we continue through Lent, as we prepare to approach yet again the cross, we sing 287 from Singing the Faith, when I survey the wondrous cross.
And so as we come to our prayers now, there is a, a bidding and a response. Uh, the bidding is, Lord, we long to live thankfully. It's on the screens now. Lord, we long to live thankfully. And the response is, help our thanks to pour out. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all the goodness we have seen around us this week. The kindness of friends and strangers. The signs of spring bursting forth in our gardens, parks, fields and hedgerows. For sunshine and warmth. And for snow. We thank you for friends of food to eat. We think in silence of a particularly special moment during this past week, and we thank you. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. We thank you for moments of busyness this week and moments of calm. We thank you for all those people who have crossed our path this week. We thank you for unexpected moments of goodness and joy, even in the midst of pain or in the midst of worry. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. Lord, we thank you for our favourite food, our favourite pastimes, our favourite music, favourite books and hobbies. We thank you for all the good things in our lives that we take for granted sometimes. Help us to see the worth and value in everything and everyone. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. So as our thoughts and prayers now turn away from our thankfulness to the world around us, we continue to pray in that same thankful vein. Lord, we continue to cry out to you for Ukraine. We thank you for those who are trying to work for peace. We pray for all who have been displaced from their homes, asking that they may find new life and love in unfamiliar places. We pray for those left behind still living with the daily terrors of attack and not knowing what will happen next. We remember all of those who have died, some of whom are known only to you. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. We pray for girls in Afghanistan, once again refused an education. We pray that the Taliban will reverse its decision and listen to your voice, encouraging equality for everyone. We pray for all the places in conflict in our world currently out of the headlines. 
Show us how we can help and support all those who need food, shelter, and education to enable them to prosper and have purposeful lives. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. We pray for our country, especially as the cost of living soars and all of us have to tighten our belts and make do with less. Show us how better to support each other, even when we might be struggling ourselves. Give us a spirit of generosity and help us to be content with what we need rather than what we want. We pray for all who work in our food banks, our homeless hostels, and our support networks. We remember all children in care and pray for those who work to find them permanent homes. We continue to lift to you all those who work in our healthcare system as COVID still runs rife in our communities. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. We also pray for the community, all the communities we are part of, where we live, our church, our schools, our places of work, our homes. Give us joyful hearts and generous spirits so that we give our best to others. We remember all who are ill or sad at this time and all who are anxious and housebound. And we hold before you in these moments of silence all those close to our hearts and yours who we name before you now. Lord, we long to live thankfully. Help our thanks to pour out. Finally, Lord, we commit the week ahead to you. We ask that you travel with us in our work, our play, our joys, and our sorrows. Help us to find space to breathe your fragrance and offer ourselves and all we have to you, for you, to make whole, to make strong, and to bring <coughs> to the fullness of your beauty. Lord, we long to live with you with thankfulness and love. We ask you to pour out your blessings so that we can pour them out to others. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we bring our worship to a conclusion, as we step out into the week ahead, we sing number 345 from Singing the Faith, and can it be that I should gain?
just sung about our imprisoned spirits. Hear once again the words of Paul who though physically imprisoned was not spiritually imprisoned as he encourages us all rejoice in the Lord always again I say rejoice let everyone see your gentleness the Lord is near do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless one another with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.